welcome back to another episode of Unclear Territory. I'm joined by my co-host, Kelly Kais. Welcome, everyone. And this week, we're going to be talking about sideboarding with familiars and what cards you could be playing and why and why not you shouldn't be playing them and where you can bring them in. So, um, we're going to go in depth about a lot of cards. And uh, these are like the most popular cards that have been, been played in familiars um, post-ban. So... We're going to go in depth about those, and we're going to start off with the anti-combat cards, and with those we're going to be starting with Stonehorn Dignitary. Uh, Stonehorn Dignitary is 1 white 3 for a 1 4, but whenever it enters your opponent um, skips their next combat step. Um, we usually use this in familiars to lock our opponent out of the game, and it's usually pretty good, but we don't play 4 in the main deck. So, Callie, do you want to go into why we don't play four in the main deck and why we play it? Yeah, so this card is um, pretty much only good against very intense remo uh, aggro decks. So something like Bogles or Stompy as well. But we can generally manage an aggro deck in game one with Snaps and Faithfuls. So we don't have to go too hard on it. And uh, we want to kind of like mitigate that plan and not be full-on drawn where we're trying to combat lock all the time just don't have a lot of slots stonehorn's pretty awesome because you can actually stack triggers where if you flicker arcane Mans or, or mnemonic wall on stonehorn and you can maybe do it three times in one turn that means they have three turns off from attacking and you can kind of uh advance your game plan on other turns which can be helpful um there's been times when you know, over the course of three or four turns, you just flicker Stonehorn and Mnemonic Wall like 20 times, and they have 20 cards left in their library, so they can never win. Yeah, I think that comes up a lot of the time, and I really like playing a main deck just for like the hedge against aggro decks, and it's really not that bad against the other like Dover decks in the format. Yeah, what Blood Pet had been doing for a long time was just having a singleton in the main, um, assuming that you probably wouldn't draw it all the times you need it, but sometimes you would just mize it and then things would go well for you, especially because you can buy time in the early game and try to draw all, most of the cards in your deck. Um, when exactly should we, bring, should we bring Stonehorn Dignitary? Stonehorn is definitely going to come in versus Stompy versus Bogles. Um, almost any attacking deck like uh, Red Deck Wins, Slivers, Affinity, um, I personally don't bring it in against Bully or Boros Monarch um, because they're a little bit slower, but we definitely also want to bring it in versus something like Elves, anything that is winning by uh, combat. Um, you would think it might come in versus something like Is It Blitz or Inside Out, but it can be too slow versus that kind of a deck. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense that you wouldn't bring it in against the fast combo decks. And another card that's very similar to Stoneheart Dignitary, and a card that we used to play a lot in the past, is Prismatic Strands. And Prismatic Strands is 1 white 2 for an instant, and it prevents damage from a color of your choice, and you can flashback it by tapping a white creature. Um, we used to play this card a lot during Sanctuary, because Sanctuary was very consistent on getting fast kills, so we didn't need to lock them out with stone horns or anything, so we just rely on combling fast. But now in, a, in the age of Ephemerate, we don't play it a whole lot. And I think the main reason for that is just, you know, we're more focusing on locking our opponents and playing a slower game plan than playing a fast one. But when exactly should we, like, still play Prismatic Strands, do you think, Callie? That's certainly true that we need to play a longer game, so Stonehorn's going to be generally better. Um, I was also kind of wishy-washy on Prismatic Strands over Stonehorn during the Sanctuary meta, but it was generally um, pretty much Stompy and Bogles as your aggro decks and elves, so those decks being monocolored Prismatic Strands is very good against. And uh, I think that in any meta that doesn't have something like Affinity or Slivers, and it's just monocolored decks, Prismatic Strand's going to be a really good call. It can be sketchy to rebuy it and get yourself enough um, ways to get rid of combat 
for the rest of the game. So Stonehorn can be good if the game is going to go long. But I think you nailed it. Yeah, the main problem that we have with Strands was that it was very terrible against Affinity. Because that deck is mostly colorless and has a bunch of other colored threats. So it's very poor there. I think that's mostly the main reason that we dropped it. Yeah. But if you're in a meta where, let's say, Stompy and Boggles are very prevalent, I would uh, highly recommend playing it there. I think if you're in a if you're in a meta where it's just the three monocolor decks and Affinity, you could still probably play Prismatic Strands because it's really good versus Boros decks, and it's very very good versus Burn, and um, post board versus Affinity, you can just sideboard into three or four uh, Gorilla Shamans, probably just three, and try to kill them that way. And in the pretty much exactly same slot we have moments peace which is one green one instant and prevents all combat damage and you can flash bagger for one green two um the main problem that we have with moments peace is that it's a green card where familiars is base blue white and green is not exactly a great color to play in familiars but if we do play it we usually play moments peace instead of a uh, stone horn or strands because it's good against all the aggro decks specifically. So. Yeah, essentially, Moments Peace is one of the fastest ways you can stop combat. So, if you're playing anything that can play rainbow colors like Rainbow Fams, or if you're playing Prophetic Prisms or Thriving Lands in your list, then Moments Peace can be very, very good. And additionally, it's going to get you eight combat locks or combat depth. Um, fogs even though you're not flashing it back so you have time to dig for your mnemonic wall to get it back I do really like moments piece it's kind of just is it worth making the mana worse just to play it usually it's not yeah it's very good at what it does um, and the last anti-combat card we want to talk about is um, God for us faithful which is played in almost every single Familiar's deck. Um, it's one white for an 0-4, and whenever you cast a blue, red, or black spell, you gain one life. Which, it's not exactly anti-combat, but as a 420 Dragon said on the podcast before, it kind of is, because it blocks and also can gain life very, very quickly. Yeah, this is one of those cards that snowballs very rapidly. There's been times when I have three of them out, and then I just get up to 50 life seemingly in a turn or two. Um, it also is something that Burn has to kill, or they'll never win. And it's another thing that Stompy has to kill, or they essentially can't win. So it's really good against small creature decks that aren't going too wide. Um, I would say it's not very good against something like Bogles, and not good at all against something like Elves, or uh, against something like Affinity. Yeah, also it's not good because they're just going to go so much bigger than your O4. And not even just like that their things will crush it, but also that they go wider. Um, yeah, it just it needs to be a few creatures that are not going to be able to punch through most of the time. And then it's kind of like a soft pacifism. And now we're going to move our move over to our other um, cards that we want to talk about, which is, are the removal spells. And the first removal spell we're going to talk about is Last Breath. Um, Last Breath is one white, one for a instant that exiles a creature with power to or less and that controller... The controller gains four life. Um, we started playing Last Breath because of the walls meta, which it was very good against because it kills any wall. And it was also very good against fairies and the mirror because in the mirror it can kill other familiars and against fairies it can kill pretty much everything in the deck. So, um, do you want to go why we play this and where exactly we're going to bring it in, Callie? Yeah, so this is one of those cards where it's kind of not that big of a downside because 
if we win, we have plenty of time to do so anyway. So four life is not going to matter that much. And it matters a lot to exile things in certain matchups. So if you're against familiars and you can last breath one or two familiars, they are very, very, very behind. They won't be able to ever buy it back with Mire or something. So they're severely um, inhibited by that. Additionally, I like to bring it in against something like Jeskai Ephemerate to try to get rid of their Arcane Answers. Most Jeskai Ephemerate lists aren't playing something like Pulse of Marasa to recur their Arcane Answer, but if you can stop their looping, you can pretty much outvalue their deck because they're it's just Moldrifter versus Moldrifter, but yours are cheaper. Um, and like you said, against walls, it's quite good. You can also potentially bring it in against something like Boros Monarch as a removal spell, since nothing in their list has a higher power than two. And uh, versus Boros Monarch, if you can kill their creatures, they're going to not be able to kill you, especially since they're slow deck, a slow creature deck. I'm also kind of a fan of bringing it in against Burn, which is kind of weird, but you can kill Thermo, and in a pinch you can always like kill your own Seagull or core or something and gain for life that way, which I've actually done a couple of times. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interaction that I haven't used. Um, maybe I'll start doing that. I like to just try to rely on Hydroblast to kill their, um, to kill their Thermos, but I think that's probably worth just having one in. It's hard sometimes to think about like how many I want to bring in. I played against a Fairies player and I just brought in two. And I have three in my list right now. And I played against, if I played against a Walls player, I would definitely bring in three. And now we're going to talk about my special tech that I started playing whenever um, the ban happened, which is Inside Out. Um, Inside Out is one mana and one hybrid blue or red. It's an instant, and you switch the power and toughness of Tar Creature, and you draw a card. Um, I started playing this card because it's very sweet against el or not elves against walls, because it cantrips and it kills one of the creatures. So it's kind of like a two. It's a it's a two for one, and um, it's not very good against much of anything else. But it was pretty neat tech. So. Yeah, it's basically a walls killer, and that's it. So you could probably do better. Um, sometimes against walls, you're kind of in a bad spot anyway because they, you might want to kill their Queerin Ranger or a Mana Elf, and it's not going to do anything about that. Of course, it's going to be brutal against the Familiar's Mirror, but you're not going to find too many good spots for it. Um, the newest addition to our removal suite has been Cast Down. Um, Cast Down is one black, one instant. You destroy any non-legendary creature, which in Popper there are zero legendary creatures that see play. So Cast Down is pretty much one mana or two mana, kill anything. So um, we started playing this card because we just wanted to test it out, see how good it was in Familiars. Um, it's been pretty good so far for my testing. I'm not sure about you, Callie. Basically, having Cast Down gives your deck kind of like the Jeskai Ephemerate feel, where you can just play counter spells and removal and control the game that way, which has been very good. Um, I initially started playing Cast Down after I ran a list from 420 Dragon um, from way back that had three Flame Slash main and a Lightning Bolt. And I thought, hey, let's play some instant speed kill things and see how that works, since maybe we could like lean into the black that way. It's been very good against um, any like go tall creature deck like Heroic. It was very, very good against Affinity as well. I think Affinity is doing things where it's like, okay, I have a 4-4, four four. you can't block it profitably, you're going to die. But they're not pumping him out quite as much as it feels like they are. So if you have a three cast down in your list, you can keep them on the back foot and make them draw into even more four fours and buy yourself enough time to win, which I liked a lot. I've been uh, playing it in Blue White FU or Blue White Ephemerate. 
and it's been really good there against stuff like Affinity, because that deck has a really tough time against the deck. So I started playing it just to deal with Affinity, and it's been really good there. I think it's like somehow it feels meta dependent. I'm not really sure why. Um, it's not super good versus Stompy because they have too many creatures, and it's not good at all. For, it's maybe a little bit good versus Elves. Um, it definitely helps versus Walls, just as much as Last Breath, probably a bit more, but it's an off color, so that can be a problem. I just wish we could play something like Prophetic Prism to just have Rainbow all the time and uh, make it easy. We do have Fire Lands, but... The only yeah, the only does get a little you bit just worse. can't tap that one blue black land, which is unfortunate. Yeah, I guess you only need one of them. Yeah, it's been all right though. Yeah. So the next one we're gonna talk about is Spirit Arrows, which saw play back in the 2017-2018 era, but we've been playing a little bit more lately. Um, it's four co colorless mana uh, for an artifact that enters with three arrowhead counters on it and you remove an arrowhead counter and put a minus one minus one counter on target creature and whenever it has zero um, arrowhead counters on it you sacrifice it so um, we played this card a while back because it was very it's very good against fairies if it comes down you are most likely going to win the game because it basically turns out their spell star sprites um, it's also great because you can use Ghostly Flicker and Flicker um, Archaeomancer and Serrated Arrows and Shrink a Dude for 1 to 2 to 3 mana, depending on how many familiars you have in play. So, Serrated Arrows is a great card. Um, there's It's great against stuff like Tribe and Fairies, and that's mostly where you bring it in against. It was kind of like anti tribe tech in the Tribe and Fairies meta. Which was very good. Um, tribe would generally have to concede if they didn't have a way to deal with it right away. The other thing that's um, important to note is that Serrated Arrows is colorless, and you can use the arrowheads to take out Guardian of the Guild Pack. Generally, Familiars doesn't have a really good way of dealing with Guardian of the Guild Pack and Pestilence, so it's been pretty good there. The card that we used to play is Capsize. Um, Capsize is two blue and one colorless for an instant. You return any permanent to its owner's hand. You can pay four colorless with buyback to bring back to your hand, which is what buyback does. Um, so it's either a three mana boomerang or a seven mana bounce something and return back to your hand. Um, we used to play this card long, long, long time ago, uh, like 2017, 2018 meta, right? Yeah, I think it was played maybe in 2017. There isn't really a good way to generate infinite mana, but I think when 420 was playing the Pirates version, he was using it as the mana sink to win the game. In certain cases. So it's like it was a also really card. good against Tron. Yeah. yeah it, was just, it was really good against Tron back then too. Yeah, because they're having a hard time keeping their lands on the board. Yeah. But... Nowadays, we don't really use Capsize. It can um, really be I've... brutal against a uh, Bounce Land deck. Yeah, like Pestilence and stuff. For sure. I don't really see a world where you play Capsize now, but maybe if your meta is just um, Pestilence, you might want to play it. But other than that, I don't think Capsize is that great. Yeah, it's tough. It's not something that we want to be playing that much. So a semi-removal spell um, is Snap. Um, Snap is played in, I think, every single Familiar's deck. Um, it's one blue and one colorless. For an instant, you return a creature to its owner's hand, and you untap two lands. Um, Snap is a very, very versatile card in Familiar's, since you can like protect your own creature, or replay a Moldrifter with it, or bounce one of their dudes as like a ritual. It's just a great card all around. Um, you play on the sideboard against... Um, well, I guess you're the one that plays it the most, Cali. So what do you bring it in against? I would... So before I was playing, like, t 
two snaps and an echoing truth and then a snap in the sideboard and that was in a list where i had three cast downs in the main and that's kind of like trying to diversify what my interaction suite is um i would always bring it in against something that i can use it against i guess like uh stompy or elves it's kind of like a buy time situation there and definitely against heroic and uh, anything playing angler uh or maybe even Delver of Secrets. It's the thing is now I go back and forth on like four in the list, three in the list, but it's just a card that can do anything. It's kind of like a blank slate. If you can pair it with something else, it becomes a modal spell, like we were talking about before. You can, if you have two familiars out, you can snap a seed oracle, and basically snap becomes slate of hand. If you have two familiars out, you can snap a mole drifter, and then you've just built yourself a, a divination. It's pretty awesome. Especially, you know, drifter snap drifter. That's one of my favorite lines, right? Good old drifter snap drifter. Who doesn't love it? Um, a new addition to Esper Familiars has been Suffocan Fumes. Um, Suffocan Fumes is one black and two colorless instant that gives all creatures your opponent controls minus one minus one and so in a turn and it has cycling to colorless um suffocating fumes is great against um aggro decks and fairy decks so that's mostly where we've been bringing it in um of course it's great against stuff like tribe and uh yeah there's not much to say about fumes what do you think about it Callie? um it seems pretty good as far as like an electric or effect, but the nice thing is you get shrinkage and so, so you can't regenerate things. I haven't really used it at all. I think it's a little bit expensive in a familiar stack to be holding up that much, especially because it reminds me of Holy Light, which I was kind of off in the first place. The nice thing is that you can cycle it, of course. So you could potentially... Ephemerate uh, Archaeomancer and get it back and then cycle it. That would always be fun. Yeah, it's a great card against fairies. And uh, not much to say about it. Um, a card that's also very good against fairies is Gutshot. Um, Gutshot has the Phyrexian mana cost of 1 red. So you need to pay 1 red or 2 life, which most of the time are going to be paying 2 life to deal one damage to any target. Uh, this card is more of a gotcha card against fairies because let's say they play like turn one fairies here and turn two they have two mana up and you play a familiar and they play spell star sprite and just gut shot the spell star sprite. So you kind of tap them out, you get your threat down and they can't really do much. Um, that's why I like gut shot a lot. Uh, we played it a lot, I played it a lot in uh, Sanctuary because there's a lot of fairies then. And, uh... Yeah, Gutshot's just a great card against them. Yeah, Gutshot does the best against turn 1 Delver, turn 1 Lana or Elves, turn 1 Query and Ranger. Anything that you have a 1-1 one, one on turn 1 that really needs to die. Because you can do it on their turn. It's pretty nice. I think it's a great card. If you're in a fairies heavy meta. Some interaction that we play. Uh, or counter spells. Um, we're going to start off with Negate. Um, negate is one blue and one colorless. Instant, counter target, non creature spell. Pretty straightforward. Yeah, this spell is um, has become better than Dispel in the deck because we can counter a lot of things that matter more, like Savage Swipe, um, Winding Way, Lead the Stampede, Pestilence. Um, Viridian Longbow, Distant Melody, things like that. Uh, I think it's probably a three of in any list. No more, no less than two. Because it's going to do so much for you. It's got a lot of benefit over Dispel, but Dispel is quite good in a counter war, of course. And Dispel is good at making your familiar land on the table. So sometimes it's hard to manage that. Yeah, in a format where, like, over half the spells that we care about are sorceries or, like, non-instants, 
Negate is much better there. Like Callie said, there's a lot of stuff like Savage Swipe and uh, Viridian Longbow, where we kind of care about those, so we kind of need Negate for that. Um, Dispel, it really only gets rid of Bolts and Counter Spells, which for the most part we don't really care about Bolts, since we have Mortuary Mire to get them back, and Counter Spells are kind of rough, but Negate can still take care of those. So. Yeah, as long as you have a familiar, Negate is just better to spell. So you're kind of playing this game where you have downside 30% of the time, and then 70% of the time is just 10 million times better. <laughs> I think uh, on the similar vein is Prohibit, which says it's one generic and one blue for counter target spell that converted mana cost of two or less and then as a kicker for two to counter it if it is converted mana cost is four or less this has been one of the go-to's since i started uh screwing around with the lists in the sanctuary meta mostly because it can hit spell setter sprite and then we had a bit of a downturn on spell setter sprite when sanctuary was banned but obviously it's still around so we have to be aware of that and it can also hit um, things like Savage Swipe or Longbow or some elf that you don't want to hit the table, which has been very good. You can, can you can also wait and uh, kick it to counter a Monarch, and that's super important. Um, <clears throat> if Boros Monarch is very big in your meta, that's also very good because the Boros Monarch players are relying on um, resolving one of the birds that to pick up the rock and continue to get their value train going so if you can disrupt that it's very very good um that kind of leads me into the exclude and essence scatter or remove soul um those were brought in over disdainful stroke for tron originally and uh after playing with it a bit and in this current meta i decided to start using exclude uh, the reason being scatter and um Removal are definitely faster and more reliable to cast, but we don't have a sanctuary combo that we're trying to just wombo combo them out on turn five to seven. So we have to play a longer game and try to uh, accrue value. Exclude is just brutal against an opposing mold drifter or value creature. I think it's pretty awesome. Yeah, I think when we started transitioning over to ephemerate, we kind of figured out that exclude's kind of the best one. Because, like I said earlier, we started becoming a slower deck, and, you know, we didn't really care about the mana cost a whole lot of Essence Scatter removal and Removal Soul. So, Exclude just became the better card, and it's also a 2 for 1, which is always nice. Yeah. For sure. Um, the last cards we're going to talk about are Pyroblast and Hydroblast. Um, Hydroblast is 1 blue. Um, destroy or counter any red spell or permanent so we usually bring this in specifically against burn and red deck wins because all their spells we can counter and we don't really bring it in against much else yeah um usually i'll bring in negates before i bring in um hydro blast or blue elemental blast against any deck playing red if i do have extra room for another counter spell i may bring in a one of and that's like to counter opposing pyroblasts or something like molten rain out of um moros bully and i think that that does pretty well as like a one of you definitely don't want more than one in your deck because it's hard to find a target so for a hydroblast against anything non-burn you just have to like hit whatever red spell you can see first and not be kind of like picky about it which has been a problem the next card we're going to talk about is Pyroblast, which is one red, um, destroy or counter target blue spell. So just like Hydroblast, it is the exact same except red. Or not blue, counter target blue spell. Um, so bring this in against fairies and pretty much any blue deck, um, like against Tron or um, Blue Black Dover or against stuff like walls where they kind of rely on their blue combo pieces so um it's much better i think if you can fit it into your deck but the problem that we have with pyroblast is that um 
it ruins your mana. But it's a great card nonetheless. Yeah, it's just um, when you're splashing for red, it's quite difficult because you really need to get that red to be able to cast the Pyroblast. So you can't be reliably having two of them in your hand, especially if you just have your mountain as the only way to cast a red spell. It becomes very problematic. You kind of get stuck with it. And then you also have to like search out a red early just to be able to cast it, which makes comboing off harder. It was one. It was a thing that it was much less reliable to do in the Sanctuary meta because you needed so many islands in play. But now with only needing one island to combo off, it's not quite as necessary. Like I would maybe play them. I go back and forth, um, but they're pretty pretty good. Like you can play a sideboard of like just three Hydro three three pyro and like one negate or two negates and be pretty much set against any sort of blue deck you can also use them as removal spells which is very very helpful they used to play it in my uh, pirate familiars list because like the splash is mostly free if you can afford the splash i totally play pyro west all day but if you're not playing thriving lands or you're not playing bounce lands um, I definitely would not play it when you could just play stuff like Negate instead. It's kind of like thinking about the meta and what kind of decks are going to be playing blue. If it's just the fairy decks and uh, other decks are not going to be very affected, it's not super helpful. It also becomes a problem when you're playing against another blue deck that is also playing Pyroblast because you can't counter their Pyroblast. But it against something like Tron, it does take the place of an Exclude or an Essence Scatter, so that can be good. It just becomes very strange when both of you are holding up Pyroblast and waiting for for the other one to cast a creature. They cast a Moldrifter, and I Pyro it, and then I cast my Moldrifter, and I, they Pyro it, and then we're just back where we started. Alright, so now we're going to talk about the other cards that you could play. Um, these don't really have a specific thing to go, like a specific category. But these are just all around good cards that you could play in your sideboard. Um, the first one we're going to talk about is Reaping the Graves. Um, Reaping the Graves is one black two uh, colorless for an instant that returns target creature from your graveyard to your hand and has storm. So you can, let's say you have five creatures in your yard and you have a storm of four, you can return all five of those creatures back to your hand. Um, we don't really play this card a whole lot because we have Mortuary Mire, which does the same thing, except slightly better. Um, but that does not mean that Reaping the Graves is not a good card. Um, we It is a good card to play against a heavy removal meta, and uh, that's really about it. Yeah, I think Reaping is good in a heavy removal meta where there's not a lot of uh, anti-graveyard, but unfortunately... There's both right now, so it's probably just worth keeping just on the back burner. Yeah. Also, like, the main problem with Reaping is that it's also black, so you have to also ruin your mana for it. But I think it can be worth. Um, another card is, that we're going to talk about is Nature's Chant. Um, Nature's Chant is one green or white and one colorless instant. Destroy target artifact or enchantment. Um... You may, you may wonder why we don't play Disenchant. The um, reason for that is because Nature's Chant gets discounted by Familiar because it has the um, oh, green hybrid mana. So that's why I play Nature's Chant. Um, it's great against stuff like Boros and Tron, I think. And it's also great against Affinity. Yeah, I would bring it in against Boros Monarch for Journey to Nowhere and Relic. And then I would side it in a lot of the time versus some sort of mid-range deck that I expect to have a Relic. Like um, MBC, which because they could have Relic or Ubalet or Pestilence. Um, I would probably not generally bring it in against Tron. Because even though it's very good against taking out the ornaments, you're still kind of like fighting to land that spell. And the, the opposing player could just flicker their ornament or something. It can be good. Um, usually instead of breaking in Nature's Chant, I'll bring in the 
single hydroblast there. Another card we're going to talk about is Echoing Truth, which is one blue and one colorless instant. You return target permanent to its owner's hand, or target non land permanent to its owner's hand, and all um, other permanents with that name. So you can, so say you're playing against Boros Bully, and they have, let's say, eight bird tokens. If you return one, all of them are gone. So E Truth is a very versatile card, where it's kind of like Snap, where you can always return your Mole Drifters or Secret Oracles, um, or you could just return their creatures as well. Oh, and the good thing about Echoing Truth is that you can always bounce non creature stuff. So let's say stuff like Pestilence, Drain to Nowhere that kind of thing, it's also very good against that. Absolutely. I think um, Echoing Truth gives you an out, basically, to everything, and that's the important thing. You can do s silly things like Echoing Truth, all of your Seagate Oracles, the three Seagate Oracles you have in play, and replay them. That's always pretty fun. You can Echoing Truth your opponent's Bonders Ornaments in response to an activation to make them replay it and kind of time walk them. You can Echoing Truth, your opponent's journey to nowhere is on all your creatures, and just go off on your turn. It's pretty cool. Uh, it's very versatile, and I like playing it a lot. Mm -hmm. I think one thing to point out with Echoing Truth is that it's all permanents, not just they control. Um, if, let's say, you protect your familiar in the mirror, it also bounces your familiars and their familiars. So... Yeah, cast it There's before that. you cast yours. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we're going to talk about Weather the Storm. Weather the Storm is one green and one colorless. For an instant, you gain three life, but it has Storm. So you can gain a million life with it most of the time. Um, main problem with Weather the Storm is that we already gain a buttload of life as it is. It's kind of just what our deck does. Um... But it's, it's good. Um, I don't know if it's worth splashing green for most of the time, but if, let's say, you're playing just Bant Familiars, I think it's worth it. Yeah, I think if you're playing um, a Bant version of Familiars moment, er, and playing Moments Piece, then Weather the Storm is probably a good option as like a single replacement for Godfarer's Faithful. Although Faithful is good because it can block, so it depends a lot. Faithful I like um, because it can block ninjas. And uh, Weather Storm obviously cannot in that case. It's hard fitting everything into the lists. Alright, last card we're going to talk about is Gorilla Shaman. Gorilla Shaman is one red for a 1 1 creature. Um, it has X, X, and 1. Destroy target's non creature artifact with CMC X or less. Or, yes, yeah, CMC X or less, right? It's X or less. Oh, equal to X, okay. So, destroy uh, target artifact equal to X. So, um, because of affinity, you only have to pay one mana and you destroy a land, which is very game-breaking <laughs> or back-breaking against them. Um, that's pretty much specifically what Gorilla Shaman is for, just for affinity. Um, problem is that usually it's too slow, but it's it can also be very good against the, the greedy affinity keeps. Yeah, it can definitely be too slow, and that's a problem. But if you can stabilize it all, it just wins you the game, because it ruins their Atog flings. The issue is that Affinity can always have some 4-4s four in play. So if you are going to bring in Gorilla Shaman, you also want to have at least 4 snaps, if not some other way of dealing with artifacts, because you want to be killing their 4-4s four or bouncing them and, or countering them early, and then uh, locking them out with Gorilla Shaman. It's not very good to be bringing Gorilla Shaman in against a deck playing only something like Bonder's Ornament or Prophetic Prism, though, because blowing that up on turn 5 is not super helpful. Yeah. It also is alright against Boros Monarch, because a lot of their mana base are artifact lands, and you can also blow up clues every now and then. So it's alright against them, too. But I don't know if it's worth bringing it in. Yeah, I don't usually bring it in against Boros Monarch. Um... Those players know how to play around a red deck, and uh, they only have like a third of their lands are artifact lands. Usually it's not too big of an issue versus them. Sometimes you can really get them though, that's for sure. But yeah, there's a lot of things you can be playing to familiars. 
um, a lot of different choices. Um, it's really up to what you think you should be playing, what your meta is, and personal preference mostly. Yeah. Um, I would just briefly like to touch on what kind of things you can bring in and out from the main deck um, while sideboarding. Uh, my main deck has four God Pharaoh's Faithfuls, which I'll remove some of them versus something like Affinity or Elves. Or I'll bring out two versus Affinity, and I'll bring out all of them versus Elves, because life gain is basically not going to make me a difference in winning that game or not. And then all of them will come out versus Tron, and uh, maybe some sort of blue-black, never-attack-you-control deck and uh, versus Jeskai Affinity. And then things like Snap, while being super helpful, can sometimes not be good enough to interact with the other board. So you can bring out one to two of those. I usually like to keep one in, but you can bring out one to two of those against a deck where snapping their creatures is bad, like um, Boros Monarch or um, maybe like Tron, because snapping their stuff is just going to make their game plan better. Um, Stonehorn Dignitary obviously can come out if you're not being attacked. Um, I actually do bring it out versus something like Boros Monarch or Boros Bully because I think that four God Pharaohs Faithful can win you the game by themselves. I do also bring Sages Rodenison out of the main versus any deck that's only going to be attacking me and uh, cannot gain life. So something like Stompy or um, Red Deck Wins or even um, like a Fey deck, I would bring out the Sage of the Innocent because it's going to be a long game and you don't really need to combo them. You can attack them for the win. I usually bring it out versus Bogles, but you have to be aware that if they get up to 80 life, it's going to be very difficult to win on time. So if they can get an armadillo cloak out, you need to get your fog lock going as soon as possible. Uh, deep analysis is one of those cuts that's really easy to make. So usually versus an uh, aggro deck, I cut the three deep analysis that I'm running and one Sage Road Ensign, which lets me bring in three Stonehorn Dignitaries and one other kind of like specific spell. And uh, in my deck, I'm playing one counterspell and two prohibits. So versus an aggro deck, I'll be taking the counterspell out usually for a more targeted um, spell like Nature's Chant or like Negate, which can be easier to cast. And most of the spells that I'm going to counter are non-creature spells, so Negate would be good. Um, I also will be removing usually a prohibit for, and upgrading into a Negate against something like Burn. Um, versus Burn, most of their their spells are actually sorceries now, so we have to be aware of that and be able to deal with those. Um, that's pretty much what I generally do. Um, I think it's like pretty straightforward because you have like anti-combat cards in your deck and you have value cards in your deck, so you don't want to keep the value cards in your deck when you're trying to just stop combat, and you don't want to keep your anti-combat cards in the deck when all you want to do is value out your opponent. It's pretty uh pretty nice that it's a little bit straightforward. Yeah. Some some choices can get awkward sometimes. Yeah. If you have to bring in a lot of cards, but So something like when to remove a single or two ephemerates. Um you may want to remove them against a spell star sprite deck. It's it's tough because you want to keep all your flickers in and if landing an ephemerate on a mold drifter will probably win you that game. But then it's like, can I ever do that? I don't know. Post board. I usually keep it in against the spell star sprite decks. Yeah. I usually board. I usually board out ephemerates and other flicker effects against aggro, for the most part, because you're not really going to be ephemerating mole drifters against aggro. You're going to be dead turn four most of the time. In my mind, what I do against aggro is, uh, well, if it's stompy, I'll try to like bait the swipes with an, one of my creatures. So I'll play like sunscape into an obvious swipe get it swiped, and then play Stonehorn Dignitary, and then Ephemerate it by myself two turns, and then keep going from there. So I wouldn't bring out an Ephemerate there. I also had, like, a crazy match, I think, yesterday, 
where um, I ephemerated Stonehorn three times against my Stoppy opponent. <laughs> and then I ephemerate Moldrifter <laughs> next turn. It's pretty funny. I barely, I barely won though because they had Relic and I bore down my Ghostly Flicker. But it worked out. But uh, yeah, for the most part, it's fairly simple. Sideboarding. Um, mostly it's how do you want to make your sideboard and what do you want to take against. So hopefully we helped you out there with those choices. Yeah, I think uh, it's sideboarding is one of those things that seems complicated, but once you understand the reasons for the cards, it becomes a lot easier. It's important to experiment and write down or think about what you did and why or why not it worked. This is also why I'm not a huge fan of sideboard guides in particular, because they don't really help you learn why you bring in certain cards, they just tell you, bring this and bring it out. Sometimes you just want to play the cards, man. <laughs> Sometimes you want to flicker some wall drifters. Thank you everybody for watching this episode of Open Memory Territory. Appreciate all you guys watching the episodes lately. Um, might There might be some late episodes. School is about to start for me. So I'll try to keep it on schedule. No promises. But for the most part, we should still have the same schedule. Um, but yeah, I appreciate all you guys watching the episodes. Um, hopefully you enjoyed. And uh, we'll see you guys in a couple weeks. Peace. Have a good one.